Hello, story seekers. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Well, well, well. Time for another round. As you all know now, we'll both tell a story we've written specifically for this episode to a shared prompt, and then discuss each other's work. Our prompt for this episode is elastic. It's time to twang us, Nico. Elastic. Awareness bloomed for Arjun Clay like the licking of flame over the dry scatter of a forest floor. Suddenly, he was everywhere in the mechanical kingdom of his stress suit. His mind probed into the fingers, and he thought about flexing them. It was an alien feeling, one that was often the end of a crisis pilot's career. The mental capacity required to go from moving body parts by reflex to actively thinking about moving them by reflex was enough to tie most people's brains into knots. The duality of self lined up. Somewhere, Arjun knew his real hand had closed, one digit at a time, and reopened like a sunflower to the dawn. Not that he'd ever seen a sunflower, beyond the archived records of a painting by some long-dead man. The process of sliding the representation of his brain into the socket that replaced it in the stress suit was easy and the journey up from the arms seemed like trudging up the staircase in your family home as a toddler. Familiar. Difficult. Tiring. In reality, all of it had taken place in microseconds. Impulses in the brain are fast. Supercomputers even faster. But actually living at the speed of those impulses made everything seem so much longer. His form was eyeless, but with time you could learn to recognise the readout of sensor arrays as though they were vision. It all came together to make a sight more than sight. No human was ever born with a velocity meter in their retina. You just knew fast and too fast. Arjun knew to the millimetre his speed, and more importantly, his altitude. The designated target floor was at 9,000 feet. The stress suit needed to be active at 25k for a textbook landing. And that was nearly 10 kilofeet out of the fucking question. Something had clearly gone wrong with the spike transfer. Arjun tried to think about what had been happening around him in the room as his consciousness was spiked. As he did so, he felt himself stretch. The thousands of miles between the meat puppet he normally drove and the battle axe with limbs that was plummeting at terminal velocity seemed to stretch eternally thin and taut, like a strand of elastic between the anchors he felt it threaten to snap. He was subdividing. Focus. Pulling back to the stress suit, he felt the backlash of that thread yanked taut. It snapped like a rubber band, catching his cerebellum square in the ass. That was going to be a serious migraine for the real body. There were only a few thousand feet to make adjustments. The grit-dense atmosphere of the planet pinked from his containium exoskeleton. Long silver scars covered it, where they were stripping away the pitch-black paint that coated him. With a moment's thought, the stabiliser flaps deployed. The sudden catching of air and violent thudding of particles against the expanding metal flaps was a deafening cacophony. At least, that's what the sensors told him. A warning flashed red along one of them. Velocity was too high. One of the panels began to lose some kind of tensile strength. A flap had buckled, all within less than a second. The infinite stretching of time gave Arjun a few long moments to react, at first with very human horror, but then with his soldier's reflexes. 10,000 would be about right. He'd travel the rest internally. Now, to make himself into a bullet. Aerodynamics were the key here. A small loss in speed was needed, but there was a use for that flap. Reaching back over his head, Arjun tore the aggressively flapping piece away. The warnings intensified, but he ignored them. With a sharp twist, the torn piece was launched. Trajectory positioning stated it would impact the building in T-minus three seconds. 
plenty of time. Angling the stress suit towards where he knew the hole would be by now, Arjun tilted and, at the last moment, opened every flap on the body. Ammo deposits flew wide. The compartments that stored his knives sprung open. A small fortune's worth of equipment was lost. But it was nothing compared to the full stress suit. The sudden increase in drag started a spiral, but it was enough of a slowdown. Impact notifications began happening at incredible speed. Too fast almost for even the consciousness to track. He was rolling. Then only the left and front sides of the suit showed contact points. He'd hit a wall. He righted himself. It took what felt like an age. Kingdoms were born and died in the imagination of Arjun as it waited for the simple task to be completed. Life signs reported. 17 million life forms detected within structure. Of these, 11 million are considered armed. Of these, 3 million are protected as members of the Accord. Proximity limiter. This floor. Lower floor. Please filter out the screaming. A child was screaming. The audio sensors buzzed wild with it. And it cut out quickly. Tenth floor must have been domiciles. Arjun didn't spare a thought for the dead. Raising one massive fist, it spread wide into a flat hammer surface. And with crushing force, it was brought down onto the floor beneath him. Under the stress suit's immense weight, it gave way. The hand still equipped with fingers grabbed the ledge and allowed the suit to drop at a reasonable pace. Coordinates suggested that he was roughly 30 paces from the safe he wanted. Well, that Command wanted. He just knew it needed to be extracted. Oh, shit! The voice was male. Vocal pattern recognition said local and around 35 years old. Shoot him! A second male. Older. Record show one Stamos Breaker Alden. Stupid nickname. In charge, though. The clank of chambers moving and guns beginning to discharge automatically flip the heads-up display into combat mode. Bullets were impacting with the torso. Arjun winced a little at the thought of the phantom bruises they'd cause. It was so difficult for the human mind to deal with an injury it didn't have. Sometimes they hurt for years. Unforgettable, but never there. Like a flame to a wasp's nest, Arjun's stress suit changed stance and began its grisly work. An arm removed at the elbow. A few sensors went crazy as blood drenched them. Aiming a pistol backwards over his shoulder, a pair of rounds found their marks in soldiers who never stood a chance. Dropping to one knee, the now one-armed man was split from neck to groin. Arjun scooped the viscera and launched it at a group of oncoming men. Instincts leapt in and they recoiled. He was among them too quickly. One taken through the heart with the close-pressed fingers of his left hand. He twisted the man awkwardly. The man's finger pressed against the trigger of his gun, and the rotation sent his shot scattering wildly into his friends. With a swift kick, the body was launched into another man, dislodged from Arden's arm with near-explosive force. The last guard tried to run. Arjun went with points for style. He knew the guys who read these reports loved it when they got creative. Gripping firmly at the foot of one man, he sliced the fallen leg at the knee. With a swift snap, he pulled loose the femur, now jagged and ruined. With laser-like precision, he launched it into the fleeing man's skull. Oh yeah, they'd love that. He crossed the room where he knew the safe should be. Gripping at the large metal box, his suspicions were confirmed. With an inhuman tug, he pulled it free of its heavy bolts. The click was loud. The sensors heard it. His body didn't have time to relax. Megaton level explosion. Deploy drag methods. Terminal velocity reached. Major system malfunctions detected in systems 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9. Panic set in. The mind so far away wanted out. 
Suddenly he was falling, the side of the building blown away by a booby trap. So simple. How had he never seen it coming? I suppose when you could see everything with our eyes, perhaps the easiest trick was a visual one. He didn't have time to reflect on the irony. Desperately, he tried to deploy the drag flaps. One was torn off. He'd done that, hadn't he? This wasn't good. Three thousand feet. In a desperate move, he tried to pull himself out of the suit. He would knew he'd feel the burns of a nuke for a lifetime. Every waking moment would be agony. But please, don't let him hit the ground. That elastic link between worlds pulled. He was going too fast. No way to pull on that thread without it snapping. Five hundred feet. A fifty-fifty chance. Where will he land? Now with a hundred feet to go, he yanked his consciousness as hard as he could. The elastic snapped. For just a moment, he realised he couldn't feel a thing. The familiar sensation of the chair, the IV, the background noise. All of it gone. Zero feet. Wow, that was, there was so much in that story. So much going on. Possibly too much. I, uh, like, you know, sometimes, when I, you know, in the past when I've done... Uh, longer ones and we've, we've had the feedback that potentially it could have it could have been it, it would have been good longer but obviously we have our own rules about that don't we yes yeah, yeah. like I, I i think potentially a bit like um there was so much world building happening that I, it felt very real but at the same time like it was kind of like pulling focus from the the way that the rest of the story was like was like drilling straight into this like war mech dude. Yeah. Um, but then if you but if you lose the other stuff, then does it become um, sort of you know like a slippery stone that you can't quite grasp because we're trying to the readers trying to get their head around this uh, you know seeing with our eyes thing and you know yeah. what can he feel what can't he feel? I I fundamentally really enjoyed it and really liked it. I almost feel like it needs sort of like potentially like the, the descriptions of like the things that he can hear and see maybe just like a little bit sharper yeah okay then, yeah, i could see that because then you'd have some more words to do a bit more building around it um yeah but it's, it's interesting i love the concept that he's going to keep any 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 damage that happens to him in this form they they effectively have as like um you know like phantom limb pain damage yeah. the rest of the life. That's really cool. I, I like that a lot. I've not actually I don't think I've seen that before. Um which is already a big win for a you know a a science fiction short story I think. Yeah. To do you know to deal with the sort of the human impact of a of a technological um advance on MacGuffin and whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. I'm calling it MacGuffin. You know I am now you said it. it. You're, gonna, you're gonna call it <laughs> MacGuffin, yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, it was it was sort of somewhere between like altered carbon and um, it had like a bit of like Pacific Rim in it, maybe like this you know this idea of this mech suit, obviously yeah. on a much smaller scale, but um, and then altered carbon with this like uh, uploading and downloading consciousness and spiking across into another body, um, all of it all of it gelled really nicely in the world, and there's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch of really cool bits in it, and then also very nice bits of writing. The um the bit about it um twanging back and hitting him square in the ass, like I I nearly didn't like that line, and yeah. then I, and then I was like and then I, I, it took me about two milliseconds to realize that no actually it needed it it needed that bit of humanity uh human humor in this you know killing machine yeah somewhere else I, I think I, that's I, yeah. that's the thing I really struggled with was. I wanted to show that he was kind of losing himself in the machine as it happens. So you, you know, to go from the kind of uh, like, oh, that that's going to sting later to, mm. oh, I've clearly just crushed someone's parents. Well, can you mute that, please? Yeah, I, I really like the mute bit. I thought that was very good. Um, it would have been cool, potentially, if that had had an impact on why he got booby trapped. 
So yeah. like, if there was some kind of like audio cue at that frequency, maybe he would miss it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Like yes, it, definitely. That could that could tie because then his little bit of humanity actually screws him up. Um, that sort of human error. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was really well balanced. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it, it felt a little bit like you were writing a bit of a me story. Is that is that sort of fair to say? Like this idea of like this. I reckon so. It was like when serious, I, wasn't it? Like, yeah. When I was thinking about it, one of the things. So a few episodes back, uh, in the tip. Uh, we spoke about writing violence and you know trying to keep it sharp, and mm. it was something I wanted to practice. Oh, you got that? Yeah, yeah. No, this. that that was a that was a really strong part of that fight. You know, this like twisting, uh, almost like gun fu that he was doing. Um, well, I think the um, that that's why it's very you. I think because when I think when I was thinking about you know what stories have done that well that I know that I can sort of use as inspiration for a leaping off point, a lot of them were yours. Mm. So it's there's there is a lot of you in it, I think. I, I guess I do fire them at you pretty much weekly, so <laughs> that's true. Uh I really enjoyed the style points bit. That was excellent. Like um this that, that you know, when I was talking about world building earlier, yeah. That was that was a bit that I would have loved to see a bit more on. Like again, maybe if we see how that impacts a mission structure, maybe like he could have come on a submarine or something, or he, he could have walked here, but no. They like they turned his consciousness on only ten thousand feet up instead of twenty five k up to see what he'd do. Yeah, something like that. Just like make it so the brass is fucking with him that's, in order that's to a create. Cool something. Note, I say, yeah, that yeah. is a really cool note. Um, and that whole that whole sequence where he like rips off his own um, drag plate to throw and create an entry point was very cool. I I could really feel the yeah, I could really visualize that perfectly. I'm glad that it um it landed. I I did struggle a lot with the prompts actually. We can talk a bit more about it after your story, but yeah, I I, I struggled with landing on something until I I took a step back and did that. Oh, no, look, it doesn't need to literally be elastic or something with elasticity. What does that represent? You know, what do you feel with that that idea of pulling and stretching? And so I'm glad that it 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 led me to something that was really good fun to write, but also that has become I'd say it definitely needs work, but a, a decent story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Um, what was there? Maybe, maybe like uh, some of the like descriptions about the the sensory descriptions a bit sharper, a bit more of the stuff like the um, you know the, the, the things that the, the notes that I've already given, yeah. and then and then maybe then pumped up to two thousand words. Yeah, you know, get a bit more, get a bit more backstory. So maybe make us a bit more invested in this guy. Um. Yeah, no, that was that was cool, and it, it, I think it's a, it's a story that's impossible to dismiss, which is um, a really good, uh, you know, really good aspect, you know, it, a solid thing to a story of, to have done. Yeah, because yeah, um, the amount of times you you know you can read a short story collection and, and just be like, oh, okay, next. Yeah, that, that that was fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to avoid that? It was fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, but nice entry. I like that one a lot. Well, speaking of collections, Ooh. that was fine. Now yeah, your story. <laughs> mm. Let's find out. No, yours wasn't fine. It was. It was good. <laughs> I'm glad. Go okay. on. All right. All right. Let's do it. Elastic. Best go fetch him back. They'd heard it a few minutes before, and again just then. Someone was still out there from the previous assault two days ago. The man who had spoken was an irregular major, and his plain uniform meant he could slip between regiments as his secret orders commanded. Arthur hadn't caught his name, but the crown insignia on his epaulets meant that his suggestion was as imperative as a screamed command from a sergeant. As Arthur stooped to pick up his end of the stretcher, the major leant against the mud wall of the trench without a care for his fine but simple uniform and lit another black-papered cigarette. Arthur could see his stretcher mate Hugo wrinkling his brow at the affectation, as the tobacco was commonly associated with German officers, and wore his unwillingness to follow the order brazenly on his face. All was quiet for a moment, as the Major closed his eyes and dragged the smoke into his lungs, then let it go in a small cloud. The groaning shout came again, thin on the air. Arthur gritted his teeth against the fear that flooded him. A moment, good man. The strange major 
picked up a satchel, which had lain by his feet and slung it over Arthur's shoulders. Take those, just in case the wind changes. Arthur nodded dumbly at the incomprehensible order and took to the ladder. They wrangled the stretcher up and over, then clambered to their feet and began to run in the direction of the groaning. The ground around them was pitted by thousands of boot wells and bullet troughs, all were part filled with the grey water that comes after gun smoke. A maze made of winding yards of barbed wire, held up by the splintered and rotting wooden chevaux de frise, directed their loping, squashy sprint. Arthur felt as though fear gave him an almost supernatural imagination. He could feel what it was like to be the German gunner, readying his weapon to shoot out across no man's land at Arthur. He winced his eyes as the imaginary shot rang out and the invisible bullet streaked towards him. No such shot was fired, and Arthur ran on into the face of his fear. They found the man in a shell crater. The bottom of it had turned to sucking mush, and the injured man, who had crawled in there for safety, was slowly drowning in the mud, unable to crawl out. Arthur dropped his end of the stretcher and slid over the lip of the crater, and half tumbled down next to the man. Here we are, mate. All's well, he whispered. Let's get you out of here. He dragged the man up so he wasn't spluttering mud with every ragged breath. The injured man unscrunched his eyes to reveal they were a deep stone blue. Artie? He muttered, disbelieving. Johnny! Arthur stared into his cousin's face, knowing that by all rights he should be stationed miles away with the reserves. His imagination ran off with him again, as he contemplated the horror for the rest of his family if a shell were to land on them both in that moment. I think my leg is broken. I'll have you back behind the lines in no time. Come on, big fella, let's get you to the medics. Arthur and Hugo hauled the mud and blood-soaked Johnny out of the crater and slung him on their stretcher. They kept themselves low and tried to work quietly, but no shouts of alarm came from the German trenches. Hugo stopped just as they were finishing. What the buggery is that? Arthur turned to look in the same direction and saw a tall bank of fog rolling towards them. The thick stuff was acrid yellow and tinged green where strands of it whisked away at the edges of the rolling mass. The gas cloud completely shrouded the German lines and was coming towards the three of them fast, driven by the wind. Arthur fumbled open the satchel the irregular major had given him and dug out its contents. He found himself to be holding a cloth and rubber mask. Simple glass panels sat in its eye holes and a large trunk-like filter covered the nose and mouth. As Arthur wondered how that strange major had known what would happen, Hugo snatched the mask from him. Too scared to be angry at the theft, Arthur dug out the other two masks from the satchel. He first put one over Johnny's head, letting the elastic straps hold it tightly to his face, and then slung the other one on himself. His breathing, rough from panic, rang loudly inside the mask. The thick yellow gas enveloped them instantly, and Arthur instinctively drew in a few testing breaths. The mask worked, yet he could barely see anything in the smog for a while. After what seemed like an age of being hunkered down over Johnny, the thickest part of the gas continued past them, and Arthur could begin to see properly again. The German trenches were a hive of activity. In them, the men swarmed, readying for a big push. Arthur could clearly see they were intending to follow the strange yellow gas in. We've got to go! Hugo shouted. Well, help me with him then! The two men picked up the injured Johnny on their stretcher and began to bound as best they could towards their own lines and back into the smog bank. Arthur felt his mask bouncing on his face, but the straps held it close. It all went wrong when they reached an unfamiliar section of the barbed wire maze. As the mass and the lingering gas made every running step a gamble, Hugo slipped and fell through one of the rotting wooden crosses. Arthur fell as well, but managed to keep Johnny from rolling off the stretcher as they all hit the mud. The barbed wire snatched at Hugo and snagged the straps at the back of his head, leaving bloody scratches on the scalp beneath. With a faint thwap noise, the elastic snapped and his mask fell. Hugo coughed once and then screamed. It fucking burns! He shouted as he struggled out of the mess of barbed wire. Arthur could see Hugo's mask was shredded in the ruined defence stakes behind him. His pity was quickly replaced by horror as Hugo scrambled towards the injured Johnny, reaching to get his mask off. Give it here, you half-dead fuck! Arthur leapt up and tackled him with all of his weight. Hugo kicked and punched as they sprawled in the squelching mud, 
but his coughing fit meant he couldn't throw Arthur off. Arthur slapped away his flailing efforts and pushed his hands against the side of Hugo's mouth and nose, quickly dipping it into the pools of muddy water to stop him from making noise. Such horrible noise. It was done in a moment. Somewhere in the mess, Johnny had passed out, and Arthur felt a surge of relief as he realised his cousin hadn't watched him kill a fellow soldier. He lifted one end of the stretcher and let the other drag in the mud as he made for the home lines. He heard the German signal whistles go off behind him as ahead the sounds of screaming and coughing suddenly grew intensely loud. When he reached the first trench, Arthur could see he'd been turned around. The dying men in that elaborate ditch wore French uniforms instead of British. It looked as though many had fled, dropping their weapons as they did so. Arthur couldn't even think to blame them as the yellow smog smudged at his mask's glass eye panels. He walked for three miles, heading in the direction he thought the town of Ypres lay. Their trudging retreat took them through yard after yard of already dearly bought muddy earth, and behind him, Arthur heard shouts ring out as the German line caught up with the French who still coughed out their last breaths. Finally, the gas cleared, and Arthur saw an allied line holding a ridge. By their colours, he judged them to be Canadian, and he was quickly ushered into their relative safety. Every man had steel in his stare, and Arthur knew they must have seen the shocking implosion of the French line on their flank. Crikey, you've done well to come out of that. The irregular major grinned at him from where he sat on a stool and watched the Canadian brass discuss potential counterattacks. What happened to the other mask? He said, taking a short puff on his black cigarette. Elastic broke, muttered Arthur as he took his off and bent to take Johnny's as well. Damn shame that, but they'll give you a medal when you're home, I'm sure. Arthur shrugged and checked that Johnny was still breathing. His cousin's chest rose and fell comfortingly, and Arthur sat next to him, wiping condensed sweat from his face. You'd best keep the masks, continued the Major. You're going to bloody well need them. I really enjoyed that. I oh. really enjoyed that. Mm. I haven't done like, oh. a history one for a while, have I? The before we even get onto the writing, the performance of that one was absolutely stunning. <laughs> Honestly, absolutely spot on. I actually wrote down Give it here, you half dead fuck delivered perfectly. <laughs> Cause yeah. that line was so real in the moment when you said it in the story. It Thank felt you. so desperate and you just you ramped it really well. The whole performance kept, you know, the, the calm in your your voice as the narrator, which you allowed it to slip a little, and it it meant the story could could naturally build, and you couldn't tell it had gone until it became sorrowful when they crossed the trench. Yes. Thought, oh no, that's oh oh god! I didn't realize it was tense, and now it's gone. And I just feel sad. It just, there's that yeah, sort of emptiness of a battlefield, isn't it? Really, there? really yeah. well constructed, especially you know for the medium. Have it, you've written that perfectly to to through delivery give the story more than you have space in the words to do. Thank you. That's the that's the goal, isn't it? It's um, it's uh, it's it's been a while since I've told a, a historical story like that. I think. Yeah. Um, and. It was interesting doing it after having done everything else that we've been doing recently. Because um, I sort of found it... I, I kept on wanting to add something fantastical to it. Yeah. Um, and it, it just it just wasn't. That almost felt like I was trying to pull away from the horror of it to a certain degree. Um, I, th I think that's an easy thing to do, though, because it is truly horrible. But the, I mean, the, the real history of that war, it's... It, it's sort of relatively easy to become quite inured to it, though. Not because of uh, we get used to the horror of that many people dying that quickly and all that kind of thing, but just because there is quite a lot of media about World War One and World War Two. Yeah. You know, it, it's. I didn't spend a huge lot of time describing in detail the uniforms everyone was wearing and what the trenches looked like and because all that. Because you know, because yeah. you know, you know, everybody knows. Um, so you've kind of got to be aware of, uh, I guess, what. Uh, what common ground you have with your audience when you're doing this kind of thing. 
But I, I think that's a fair assumption to think that people will know what that war looked like. Yes. Or at um, least what the media represents that war as having looked like. I uh, I tried to find another way to describe the Chevaux de Fries. Yeah. That would that didn't involve using those words, which is which is the technical term for them. The horse of something. I'm not sure what. Uh, yeah. Mean. So it's it's essentially yeah. like um these like it's, I think they're called Frisian horses. Um, ah, there you go. The horse. But, of but if I had said Frisian horses, it would have just been be like, what? Why are the fucking horses? What? What? Why are there wooden horses here? Yeah. Whereas using the technical term for them allows it to be. But they're the um like the the cross you know the X. Yes, like I, I, cavalry things. The way you described them meant that I knew what they were. It was slightly later you talked about them being a big wooden cross. But, ah, okay, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, I know what yeah. that looks like. I um, I sort of deliberately did that the second time when they're coming back, so that you have a different bit of description, so that we sort of it all sort of clicks. That potentially maybe that should have happened up front. Um, There's a um. Lovely bit of foreshadowing with just uh, just in case the wind changes, which I thought was yeah, just in case the wind changes. This, so this I, man who has clearly been a spy for the uh, over on the other side for that's some right, time. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed the irregular major. Um, the, the character that if this was a tabletop role play, you would have been playing. <laughs> yes, very much so. Um, I, I've completely invented the uh, the black paper cigarettes. It just that was a necessary. Um, yeah. Uh, sort of um, uh, conceit, really, but pretty much uh, a lot of the other stuff. I think I've basically got mostly right about um, this. Is the uh, the second battle of uh, Ypres in uh, 1915, yeah. um, and it's the first time that chlorine gas was used. Oof. So it's the reason he doesn't know. He doesn't know what, what it that is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I have taken some liberties with the fact that the major has masks. Um, because really they weren't invented and put into common, even non-common use uh, for months and months and months. Yeah. It took, there was a big period of time after this happened where the men were just told to have a rag and piss on it and then hold yes. that to their face. That I do know about. Um, yeah, uh, which is pretty fucking awful, isn't it? Yes, rank. <laughs> and then obviously later on it got replaced by um, uh, mustard gas because mustard gas it gives you like blisters, it affects the skin rather than... Yeah. In, inhaled so it, there were people were trying to get around the masks but um i think it's okay because he's as, as you say he's he's clearly a spy yeah. he know he knows it's coming and he's potentially got the resources to have some knocked up what's interesting is why he gives it to the gives it to these guys i think whether it's like go and field I, test these i assumed that the the cousin was also a spy Ah, yeah. Because you said you know he's miles away from where he's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, that's 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 a great interpretation. Um, I I like that a lot. There were um, some fantastic descriptions in there, by the way. The um, describing Hugo's voice as being rough from panic gives you that real sense of like that that hoarseness that comes with a hyperventilation. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, but in a very, there's lots of nice tactile stuff like that. Or you said loping, squashy sprint when you talked about them <laughs> running across no man's land. And it paints a perfect image of trying to run in horrible mud. Well, it's actually a really horrid, like, grammatic, like, it, it doesn't look right on the page. But it, yeah. it, that's kind of the point. Like, it's one of those odd moments where you've got to do something a bit disgusting to the English language in order to actually capture something really odd unsettling and gross yeah um, that's the thing it's the it's the, the the sort of forcible insertion of squashy because a loping sprint is fine but the the squashy is kind of squeezed in there in like you said an uncomfortable way and it does give it that sort of air <laughs> feeling <laughs> yeah definitely absolutely horrendous but yeah, yeah just i think a really strong story that i think you know like you say if you if you really start pulling it apart so well gas mask didn't invent uh, blah, 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 whatever but i think as just a little standalone snapshot of a moment in a horrible war it does a really good job of dragging it down to a human level because this man can't comprehend the true horror of what's happening because he looks at those french trenches and he thinks oh they've all run away i can't blame them not 
thousands of men are dead because yeah. he's thinking on the scale of one man. Yeah. But he the man who can comprehend that thousands of men are dead is so calm. So calm. It, yeah, just just really nicely put together. It's it's very in your wheelhouse, but I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think you took all the the kind of fundamental building blocks. I tried. That yeah, you're I, used to working with and when well, you could stack them up like this, or if you wanted to be a, a badass, you could just make a bridge or something. It felt yeah. very good. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I'm, I, that's that's really kind of you. That's really nice, um, like feedback. I, I think it was um, it, it was largely um, I don't even know really how to describe it, but I I felt like I was trying to implement things that we've learnt from doing this podcast and the writing that we've done for yeah. the, the tiny bookcase. So although it was in my wheelhouse, I felt like I was implementing a bit of uh, you know um, you know, like implicate like uh, Hemingway impl implication in the way that people were speaking to each other. I found myself like removing speech tags quite a lot, um, sort of yeah. you know, narrow it down. Uh, I tried to have some economy of description in the fight, which is almost ubiquitous amongst all the um, all the the sort of uh, the um, stable of all you know write like authors that we've done. Everyone yeah. says that. Um, so yeah, no, it it, it felt like um, it felt good, but uh, it as with everything, it it came from um, a conversation about the the battlefield um like a like a, a week or two ago yeah. and I, I sometimes i just can't get bits of history out of my head until i write something about them and this was one of them like i needed to actually visit it a little bit and try and try and understand it i think there's a there's a bit of world war one I, I need to write about i think but it's the uh the french turning up in in bright yellow on horses with swords and bows the first day that the Germans use the machine gun, and I think about it all the time. Mm. <laughs> it's just yeah, that's... Sort of the end of honourable battle. That's I mean, it's a different era, but it it's sort of got like a charge of the light brigade yeah angle to it, hasn't it? You know, you're charging into a different kind of war. I d I don't think there's any way to write that story that isn't so bleak, unless you write it from the the perspective of a a German scientist who's really up against it and he desperately needs his new invention, the machine gun, to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the Germans did invent the machine gun, actually. I think the Lewis gun might have predated yeah. the um, the German uh, MG. Yeah, to be fair, but, I mean, like the Gatling gun as well is a, quite an old thing, isn't it? True, really? yeah, yeah. But, st yeah, potentially... Um, yeah, If you like that bit, there's a song... Um, I don't know whether it's originally by him, but there's a version by... Um, an artist called Corb Lund, called "I Want to Be in the Cavalry," and he he basically does the song from the point of view of all famous um, cavalry armies or divisions, you know, starting in ancient history and running through to the modern day. And it's really cool. Do the winged hussars. He of course does do the winged oh, hussars. Yeah. yeah, good. Does some British caval cavalry at Waterloo as well, and um, special forces on the. In in the uh, in Afghanistan that kind of thing it's 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 really quite a cool bit of um, yeah so, you know folk songwriting and stuff but uh, just one more thing about the story before we move on. Um, on I wanted to note the Canadians because you don't often see that in a lot True. of World War dramas like it's like ah the British and sometimes the French and definitely the Germans um, but the Canadians in particular at uh, Ypres were like astonishingly brave um and at one point i'm fairly sure it was so so we meet this this group of um canadians at the end here and in my mind they're the um uh the the sort of the second i think they're, they're the second canadian brigade who were ordered to counterattack into the gap oh wow and they had no idea what was on the other side they'd never seen this weapon used before they just watch it implode battalions of French, and they did it. Um, and they had to do it without reconnaissance. They got into trouble really early on because they had to go through a wood, yeah. and uh, they responded to that with an impromptu bayonet charge. Oh. And they cleared. Wow. They cleared like this massive oak plantation of Germans, taking a seventy-five percent casualty rate. 
which is we're going to start ridiculous. another podcast where you just tell me history. Things, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just wild. Like you know, where does that bravery come from? Like that madness. Um, Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But it, it it's been like commemorated in famous pieces of art and stuff because it was a really you know massive yeah. thing that the Canadian regiment did. Anyway, yeah. So stories happened. They did. Um, in spite I, of our best efforts. <laughs> in spite of our best efforts, yeah. It's quite difficult sometimes, depending on the, the mental state you're in when you finish writing a story and you edit it and yeah. read through it a few times, to not feel like, oh, this is, I guess it's a story, but I don't know if it's good. And yeah. I, I, I kind of don't know where to get that from. Like, should it just not even occur to you that it it's good or bad? You know, maybe it should just be the best that you can do and then fuck it. I think so. I... I think it's really difficult, especially in all creative endeavors, to be truly, you know, able to take a step back and give a, a completely unbiased opinion on things. And for some people, that's that they think everything they do is exceptional. And well, that's yeah, people... that's ridiculous. Like, I, I, I don't know of any super talented artist that think that think like that. So I... generally, the better you are at something, the more you will critique yourself. Sure. And it does make it very difficult because you think I I could probably do that better. I've done that better before, or I've I've heard someone else do that better, or read someone else doing that better. And I think it's uh, first of all why it's really good to have someone to sound it off of. I mean, we do that here, which is great. Mm. But even before we come here, you know, reading it to a partner or a friend, or even just out loud to yourself, it means that you get kind of a different sense than just reading it on the page. And also someone who you can trust to tell you if you've done a bad job and they're really hard to find. But it's also what I like about this because if one of us had, and it's happened in the past, if one of us really drops the ball, we will just say, you know, we're not going to be mean, but we'll be honest. And I think that's a really important part to, to as a creative, being able to evaluate whether what you're doing is is good or bad or you know leaning towards one or the other uh, it's a it's a it's a tricky bit isn't it but you i think yeah. <laughs> as long as as long as it gets to a point where you know obviously we we have a we we, we have a schedule to keep with the with the podcast which yes. actually sort of keeps me honest to a certain degree because i'm fairly sure quite a lot of the stories even the ones that have gone down quite well i would without the schedule of the podcast and you know with you know um you know we have to perform with the guests at the certain times and this kind of thing yeah. i'm i'm fairly sure i would have like shelved them because they weren't good enough at it you know inverted quotation marks um i've comments. definitely had the 11th hour panic where you say i could just write another one and then you realize you've got like 19 minutes till we're gonna meet up with a lovely guest and i'm like well, uh. That's yeah, I, happen. <laughs> I guess I guess I haven't had that because I I always reach the fuck it stage, yeah. Where it's like it's done, it's got it's got to be done, and so it's done. I've done the best job that I can do, you know. I've sat on it for two days, a week, however long. I've done it. I've done some edits. Yeah. I've, it's what it is, and this is the story that came out when I responded to the prompt. Um. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a tough thing. Um. I think very enjoyable though to actually just do it. I think yeah. it's, it's almost freeing to just be like, time to perform. I think it's it helps as well to it. It's really difficult to not get stuck on whether things are worthy. Like, am I writing about something that's stupid, or oh my god, have I completely flopped this prompt? Like, you could get some really important <laughs> stories out of it. Yeah. yeah. But then sometimes you have to go. That's not the point of this. It's not an essay. You're not being graded. If that's yeah. what it sparked yeah. in you, that's what it sparked in you. Sorry, sunshine, you're broken. Yeah, I, I felt that, like that a little bit with our um, our, our most recent guest, uh, Katrina Silva. He was excellent. We had a fucking wonderful time yeah. talking to her and interviewing her afterwards as well. Um, and uh, I, of course, you know, I, I turned into a piece of um, sort of like almost like D&D style fantasy, um, fantasy writing. And it was, it was in, for my mind, in no way worthy. But I had a lot of fun writing it, and that's where yeah. that's where my mind went. Um, it it just so happened that she'd written 
a really exquisite An piece of epic fantasy, piece of fantasy <laughs> that, that I then had to read afterwards. So that's where the oh fuck it mentality really falls down when somebody else is a magnificent writer and you have to go after them. Wait a minute, are you saying that hubris can destroy us? <laughs> this is it news. It, has, it hasn't killed me yet, Nico. So. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. <laughs> Swing. That's that's my best sword noise. That sounded like you just pulled your knob out. <laughs> oh yes, shit! Hang on, R wrong belt. <laughs> Swing. Wrong belt. <laughs> oh well, thanks for seeing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know we like you know we like to end on a knob gag. <laughs> Always end on a knob, Ben. Excellent. And we'll be back next week. See you then for more stories. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're gonna miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at the Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For a Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?